We have a treat that today. We got Dr. Tepper from the University of Nebraska. He's a board certified ophthalmologist and specializes in low vision rehab. Um, he received his medical degree from St. Louis University and completed his ophthalmology residency training at the University of Chicago Hospitals. He practiced comprehensive ophthalmology from 1994 to 2005 in southern Minnesota. After experiencing personal health issues, he developed a great concern for low vision patients and pursued a fellowship in the field in 2006. He now serves as the director of the Weigel Williamson Center for Vision Rehabilitation and is also the assistant professor of the Department of Ophthalmology at the Trollson Eye Institute at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. He has developed rehabilitation plans for over 5,000 low vision patients and speaks nationally on low vision rehab topics, including depression related to irreversible vision loss. Originally from Southern California, Dr. Shepard has lived in Omaha, Nebraska since 2007. He's a member of the American Academy of Ophthalmology, Nebraska Association of Eye Physicians and Surgeons, and the Association for Education and Rehabilitation of the Blind and Visually Impaired. Since 2013, he has been a member of the Vision Rehabilitation Committee of the American Academy of Ophthalmology, and he has served as the chair of this committee since 2018. So with that, I'll put the floor, give the floor to Dr. Shepard. Thank you. Well, wonderful to be with you all here as you enjoy your lunch. And so hopefully with this presentation, we'll fulfill the commitment and you'll be able to learn something. So um, I really enjoy presenting this topic. Um, I do want to indicate I don't have any financial relationships to disclose. I'm going to start my presentation by talking about a study that was done in one of our ophthalmology journals, JAMA Ophthalmology, a year ago. And what this study was looking at is ophthalmologists referring appropriate patients for vision rehab services that have irreversible vision loss and referring them into hands of low vision providers like Dr. Mondal. And basically what this study showed is that the referral rate was very, very low, 11.4% of patients that could benefit. And one of the conclusions of the study was the need to better educate ophthalmologists and residents in ophthalmology about referrals to low vision rehabilitation services for patients with irreversible vision impairment. So um, what I would like to share with you is that as ophthalmologists, uh, I've discovered that we do a fantastic job of evaluating the macula in people that have macular degeneration. I should mention that macular degeneration is actually the number one cause of irreversible vision loss in individuals over the age of 65. It's the number one reason I see patients in my office in Omaha, and it's one of the greatest reasons for needing low vision services. So this study, what it makes me realize is, I think we do a great job of looking at this. I think we evaluate and examine the macula well, we prescribe vitamin and mineral supplements to slow progression down, we inject medications appropriately for wet macular degeneration, all the things that we do. However, as ophthalmologists and as eye care providers, don't think we do nearly as good of a job at recognizing and addressing the impairment, the patient behind the macula and the struggles that our patients are having doing their favorite activities and the frustration and even the depression that can result from this. So, as Dr. Mondal mentioned, I'm not, uh, I have not always been a full-time low vision specialist at an academic medical center. First half of my career was in private practice as a comprehensive ophthalmologist. And today I'd like to share with you a story that will help you understand why I actually made that transition, how I became at a place where I really started to understand the needs of low vision patients and the importance of addressing the impairment, and a story that might suggest another title of this presentation. And that's how I discovered as an ophthalmologist that I was actually blind about living with macular degeneration. So my story begins three years out of residency. I'm building my comprehensive practice, growing surgery, it was great. And I unfortunately developed some back pain while shoveling snow. Now most of us have had some back pain. 
last few days, maybe a few weeks, we walk a little funny, we have to avoid a few things, take some anti-inflammatories, but then we get back to normal. So this unfortunately got worse by the week and then it extended into months and it wasn't getting any better. And unfortunately, in the midst of this, I injured my right knee while I was playing with my children. Now, having knee pain made me walk funny. That threw off my back. So now I was kind of in worse shape. The other thing is, is those of you who have back pain, you know you have to bend with your knees to get down to the ground. So when I had back and knee pain at its worst, I wasn't able to do and reach anything on the ground. And what started to become very an awareness for me is what I could not do because it wasn't going away. And this affected me at work and affected me at home. At work, getting into the slit lamp, going from room to room, getting that position was very uncomfortable. So that was slowing me down. Getting at the operating room microscope to do cataract surgery was also very uncomfortable. And it was making it difficult to do those things. At home, it affected my ability to enjoy playing with my children in the ways I was accustomed to, and even carrying out basic chores like putting dishes in the dishwasher started to become difficult, and then doing more uh, uh, involved tasks such as mowing the lawn, things that I would normally take for granted. Well, naturally, I sought medical help, and actually, to summarize this, over a period of several years, I saw several different health care providers, tried numerous different pain medication regimens, spent months and months in various types of physical therapy, and had two surgeries. The end result was I was still living with pain that was limiting my ability to do day-to-day -day things. Now, um, my healthcare providers were very skilled, they were very knowledgeable, but they were woefully insensitive to the realities of living with chronic pain. These were some of the comments they would make as I journeyed with them. And what I would tell you about these comments is there is an element of truth. But these comments don't inspire hope, they don't encourage, and for me, they actually fueled some anxiety and despair. I didn't see this coming, but three years, I remember dealing with all these symptoms being able to, to walk and realize that I was uncomfortable, struggling at work, adjusting work schedules, canceling surgeries while I tried to go to another doctor who lived a little bit further away than the last one to try and get help. And the I can'ts started to outweigh the I can'ts. And I actually ended up making probably one of the most difficult decisions of my life, and that's to stop doing surgery. This is something that precipitated an identity crisis that I didn't anticipate. What is an eye surgeon that doesn't do surgery? And what's my place in what I've studied to be? And then there was another identity crisis that was kind of looming. And as my 10-year-old daughter would hand me my son because I could not reach down into the crib to simply put him out, uh, excuse me, simply bring him out and hang on to him, she had to hand him to me while I sat in a recliner and would wait there until I would give him back. Uh, one particular day when we were doing this and I was looking out the window and there was my dear wife mowing the lawn again, I just had this moment of realizing I'm not a man anymore. And this whole process was very demasculinizing and that was I was struggling with that. Things that were enjoyable, I no longer was finding enjoyment in doing. I was recognized I was living a less than normal life, a marginalized life, and I had a tremendous sense of abandonment. As my colleagues would get excited about going to a meeting and learning new surgical techniques, well, I, what good is that going to do? And so, and then if I had friends at church, and we went to a camp with our daughters, and there was a ropes course. And one of the dads would take my daughter to do the ropes course because I couldn't do it. And I remember staying back in the cabin and how I felt about that. I'm a man of deep Christian faith. And God, can you heal me? I'm doing this for your purposes. And silence. And what eventually happened was is that I ended up being hospitalized and diagnosed with major depression. 
and I was actually treated as an outpatient for two years for major depression. So this was a very, very difficult, very dark time in my life a number of years ago. Now, one of the things that none of my healthcare providers ever talked about was how to live with this. And can you live with chronic pain? And the answer is a resounding yes, but the emphasis is different. We're not looking at your knee, we're not looking at your back, we're looking at the disability it causes, and we're seeking to minimize the disability. And there are ways that you can do this. One of my favorite examples to talk about is I would struggle to walk on a treadmill at the gym. My knee would get irritated, my back would get irritated, and then I couldn't walk around the neighborhood with my children. It was too uncomfortable. Well, what do you do if you can't walk to build up muscles and be healthy? And I remember I had some difficulties moving in the clinic and some of my patients would actually say, how are you doing? And for a while I wouldn't answer and then eventually I started saying, well, I'm having trouble and one. And I had a couple of ladies that told me, you ever thought of pool walking? Pool walking, yeah, you get in a pool, you walk around because, you know, the water absorbs. I started doing that and I could actually do that well. And then I got strong enough to them where I could get on the treadmill and I could walk the neighborhood. So there are these strategies. Should be learning about them from one of my healthcare providers and not my patient sitting in the chair, but I took it. So um, pain management clinics exist to actually deal with these issues. And that was never really mentioned as an option. So now what about my career? Well, by default, I became a medical ophthalmologist where I had an epiphany after some time. I realized that I needed my doctors to help me make this transition, but I realized that as a doctor, I did not do this. I started to realize that my patients with macular degeneration were in the same place, except their symptom was blurred vision. And this blurred vision, which we can't make go away, makes it harder for them to do things. And I'd start to ask, what are you having difficulties doing? And the floodgates opened. I can't read, I can't drive, I can't use my computer, I can't recognize my grandchild's face. And as I sought medical care, they've come to me. And yeah, I was doing all the right things. I was prescribing the best glasses possible, and I was prescribing the eye vitamins, and we were treating the wet macular degeneration. But it didn't make the problem go away. They still were dealing with the issues that were causing the disability. And those comments that I, the doctors made to me that fueled anxiety and uh, didn't offer a lot of hope. So I asked myself, what am I telling my patients? And I will show you, these were the things that I was saying. And I would point out, as I look at these comments, they do not offer encouragement, they do not offer hope, and they could potentially fuel despair. The third one here, you can go to the drugstore and try a magnifier. Most of the patients that come to me in my low vision clinic come with the magnifiers from the drugstore that are not working. So what I realized was, is I was sending them out with hope to try this magnifier to find out this doesn't work. One more, I can't. So as I became depressed, I started to ask, could my patients be depressed? And there are actually studies. I'm going to show you two that show that the rate of depression is up to 30% in patients going to low vision clinics. 30% is in these two studies. This would imply that low vision patients are three times more likely to struggle with depression than the general population. That's the same rate of depression in outpatients being treated for life-threatening diseases such as cancer and stroke. Now, I needed to learn to live with this. Can you learn to live with vision impairment? And that is what low vision rehabilitation is all about. You can think of low vision rehabilitation as the branch of ophthalmic care, concerned with providing the necessary optical devices, skill training, environmental adaptations, and counseling to minimize vision-related disability when no restorative process is possible. Now, why is it important to diagnose depression? Well, it does not typically go away without treatment. 
It adversely affects physical health, emotional health, and spirit. It negatively affects relationships with other people, especially marriages. And I tell you, this would be its own lecture. My wife was the glue that held us together. I was not easy to live with. Yes, I had a problem with struggling with it, but boy, does it put tension there. And so um, I'm very thankful for the wife that I have. Depression can be deadly. Suicide. I actually did attempt suicide. And uh, glad to be able to share with you here today uh, because obviously I did not succeed. And it can be treated. Perhaps one of the greatest reasons to make the diagnosis of depression. So, in an eye clinic, are we going to treat depression? Well, we'll get back to that. But in its typical sense, no. But we can recognize it. Are there ways that you can screen for depression? And the answer is yes. In my clinic, I use the geriatric depression scale. My average patient is 82. This is 15 questions. The technician does it. And basically, by the number of responses that are answered a certain way, I get a real good sense if this person is not likely depressed or if they're very likely to be depressed. And that then, if they are very likely depressed, we have a conversation. How common it is to have depression, kind of chat through it a little bit, and then we also find an avenue where they could end up getting help, because I will not treat with medications, that kind of thing. There are shorter questions, like the patient health questionnaire, two questions long, that an eye clinic could use, if desired, to get an idea if a person is depressed. So there are ways to screen or to recognize it. Now, in regards to interventions, most of us are aware there are medications, for depression, and there are counseling strategies for depression. But we don't typically think of low vision rehabilitation as a treatment for depression. However, I'm going to show you a study uh, that will show um, how that can be considered as such for individuals that are dealing with irreversible vision loss and depression from that. So to kind of understand that a bit more, I'm just kind of going to go through um, comprehensive low vision. What's it all about? Now, I will tell you, as an ophthalmologist, I always thought, well, low vision is magnifiers. Magnifiers are a tool that we use, but that's not just, that's just one arm. It's not the bigger picture. The bigger picture is we're minimizing the disability. So the first thing is, what are you having a hard time doing? There are a whole array of areas where a person might be having a hard time. So, in a comprehensive low vision practice, you're going to go through these areas to find out where the person is struggling. And you might look at this and go, wow, it could take a while. Well, the average time I spend with a patient in my low vision practice is it's rarely less than an hour. And so when I was talking to Dr. Mondal, and she's spending more time with that. But you're doing all these elements, if you will. It's a very different approach when you're addressing the impairment to where you're addressing the disease. So the other thing is being concerned with how the patient is adjusting and adapting to the vision loss. And this is where we administer the depression scale, the importance of listening. So it takes time to listen providing the emotional support. We have support groups at our Low Vision Center. There's all kinds of things you can do. Um, number one reason people come to a Low Vision practice is reading. Uh, these charts, I find most people are unfamiliar with Low Vision, have never seen a chart like this. To tell if a person is struggling with read, you've got to have them read. And so, we have print of different sizes. What's really great about this is that if you know a person wants to read an article in the newspaper, and they can read this, and this, and this, and this, just fine, but not this, well then I need to make the article this size for them to read it. So now I've got an idea of how big things need to be for them to read it. And then I can look at different types of ways to magnify things to make things at large. However, there's a number of individuals where areas in the macula are creating blind spots where it makes even reading this hard and they stammer and they struggle to get through it. Well, there are testing equipment. This is called a scanning laser ophthalmoscope. And in short, it gives us a functional map of the macula. It helps us to identify where the macula is not working and where it is. Why is this helpful? If a person can see here, but they've got a blind spot here, they're going to struggle moving that along the, the line of print. You have to teach them how to minimize the interference of the blind spot, maximize the use of the good area, 
And I work with low vision occupational therapists in my practice in Omaha, and they are trained in providing these visual skills training activities to help people navigate print better, along with the right magnifier. So sometimes you need more than magnification. Contrast is very important. So if I have a person that struggles getting down to that second line, and then they can't see any of these, then that tells me we're going to have to enhance the darkness of print. And there are going to be certain household things that may be difficult, like navigating stairs. And here is a stairway for people that struggle with contrast. The steps blend into one another, and we have individuals that can't get down to their basements anymore because they can't see the steps. But how about something like this, where you enhance the contrast? And by putting a contrasting strip of something on the edge of each step, you now have a new cue to go down your stairs. And our occupational therapists actually can make home visits. Medicare reimburses for occupational therapist services. And so, yeah, we have patients that, wow, I can go back down to the basement again. Lighting is so important, and people need different lighting to be able to maximize their ability to function and to especially to read, and so we evaluate different types of lighting. Uh, most of my patients are using their cataract sunglasses outside. When you have macular degeneration, that makes things so dim. Lighter shades might be better. And there are indoor sunglasses that might make it easier to minimize glare watching that television. And so we can look at all those things. There are a lot of non-optical devices, large numbered watches, clocks, calculators with large numbers, and that also talk. All kinds of different resources that are out there that have nothing to do with magnifiers. And then there's magnifiers. So, and magnifiers don't just come in the handheld variety. There are ones for the patient with arthritis or tremors that sit on the print. Uh, there are headborne magnifiers, telescopic lenses to see the television and uh, see the grandchild doing the dance recital um, or the soccer game. Um, video magnifiers, where you can put print under a camera, project the newspaper article or your book onto a nice big screen, get a lot more real estate than with a small handheld magnifier for people that want to continue reading their books. And, um, uh, and this day and age, computers, there's bigger screen computers, magnification software products, ways to get the computer to read to you, and smartphones, and apps that can enable you to distinguish colors and uh, talking to the device, voice activated assistance, all kinds of strategies to live with this better. So there is a wide array of things that we can do and there are professionals that can come along us as eye care providers like occupational ther therapists um, and CLVTs, uh, that kind of thing, who can do training to help people navigate these different tools, find out what works best for them, what works best in their home environment, so in essence, there's a lot we can do. So does this help with depression? Let's look at this study. It was in ophthalmology, our journal from 2014, and it was a randomized controlled clinical trial that tested the efficacy of low vision rehabilitation to prevent depression. 200 subjects randomized to low vision rehab or supportive therapy, which was a standardized placebo treatment controlling for attention. And what they found was that low vision rehabilitation halved the incidence of depressive disorders relative to supportive therapy in patients with macular degeneration. And the conclusion of the study was that low vision rehabilitation, in this case using low vision specialist and trained occupational therapist, served as a model to prevent depression in vision impaired populations. So there are strategies that help people to minimize the disability that might be able to help with the depression. So as the initial study I showed you at the beginning showing that rate of 11.4%. There are other studies that show, as ophthalmologists, we're not thinking about the impairment. And we're thinking about the disease, but we need to be thinking about the impairment. And this is especially important because statistics show that visual impairment is on the rise. And this was a study in 2016 in one of our journals, Gen Ophthalmology, that showed visual impairment is expected to double by the year 2050. So we got a lot more people coming in with this. So need to be doing a better job. In our eye clinics, probably the most significant thing is recognizing the patient that needs help. And really the best way to do that is by asking a key question. This could be a technician with the patient. 
if you have a person with irreversible vision loss, uh, and they, they, they have an eye condition for which we can't cure, does your vision loss make it difficult for you to participate in your daily activities? And if the answer is yes, whatever it might be, then our treatments, because we can't cure this, are not going to solve the problem. So that patient needs to go to Dr. Mondal or to Low Vision Rehabilitation Services because that is where we'll address the impairment. So the important thing is having a willingness to listen. I find that often we're going from room to room to room, but we need to kind of step back, maybe change the culture of what we're doing and be willing to take the time to listen to find the person that is impaired. And, uh, and then getting these people in the hands of the appropriate individuals. Well, I hope you've enjoyed your lunch, and I hope you've had a good learning experience. It's been a pleasure presenting this to you, and if there is any time, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Appreciate your attention.